I don't know about you, Jason, but it feels like I'm always on call for my family's tech support agent. But with COVID-19 and social distancing, I haven't seen many of my family members in the last few months. That doesn't mean that people can no longer get help, though. Thankfully, it's easy to remotely connect to, and take control of a computer to help a friend or a loved one troubleshoot an issue. Today, we're going to talk about remote, remote tech support. I'm Jason Cipriani with Jason Perlow, and this is Jason Squared. So, Perlow, what kinds of problems have you been able to help or heard of family members needing help to fix remotely? Well, you know, it's funny. You know, my dad recently called me in an absolute panic because he accidentally deleted the entire contents of my mother's desktop, right? So my mother oh, no. is like one of these people who has like, you know, she's got Windows. She's got Windows 10, right? Which with all mm -hmm. the, you know, the, 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 the Windows... It's got that more advanced start menu, but she's still the type that has been doing things the same way since, I don't know, Windows 3.1 or Windows XP, which is to dump everything she owns, all her icons, all her files on the desktop. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it so, just looks horrible. Um, it gives me I, the heebie-jeebies. Uh, it gives me tremendous heebie-jeebies, right? <laughs> uh, and it must give my dad heebie-jeebies because he probably tried to rearrange stuff and then he deleted it then or clicked the wrong button and pff, gone, right? <laughs> so I had a remote in the other night and see what he did and reverse the deletion, right? Um, yeah. Now, but occasionally I've also seen things like, you know, malware, annoyware, stuff like that that has to be removed as well or, or diagnosing something wrong with an app that needs to be reinstalled something like that you know they're very, normally pretty typical things yeah so i i've had some family members my mom being one of them reach out to me during this whole thing um and she actually had COVID back in march and she needed help oh, wow. on working on her macbook and i don't remember exactly what the problem was but obviously i they're Going and visiting her was completely out of the question. It just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so I, I've i used, and we'll get more into apps later, but what I was able to do with her on a Mac was use iMessage's built-in screen sharing option. And I was able oh, to cool. remotely, without having to walk her through installing some sort of application and go through the process of getting a verification number and all of that, I was able to just have her click a couple buttons, me click a couple buttons, and we we're able to connect and I was able to help her out that way. And it worked really well, but it can be very frustrating trying to talk to someone over the phone. And we're, we're learning this with remote learning right now. My kids just started, uh, they're on their second week, finishing their second week of remote learning and having teachers call when there's an issue and try to talk my wife, me, or my, one of my kids through getting to a certain aspect of a website or how to submit an assignment is Man, it is frustrating as can be. So being able to remotely access a computer and either just see their screen so you know what they're looking at or take over and control the mouse and keyboard and be able to actually troubleshoot and go through the steps yourself is a huge benefit. Um, what what kind of applications are you using to help family members? Uh, first of all, I thought that it's very cool that you say that about iMessage. I didn't know that you could do any kind yeah. of built-in screen sharing uh, with iMessage. It is iMessage. awesome. Yeah, that's, that's it, it's awesome. kind of a hidden feature. Like it's it's not very obvious in the messages app on a Mac that it's even there. You have to click a couple buttons to get there. But those couple of buttons are all you need to do. If you're signed into iMessage on your Mac and your family member or friend or whoever is signed into iMessage, it's an instant connection and you have full control over their computer. It's, it's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Um, so Microsoft Windows has a very similar feature built in called Quick Assist. Uh, okay. But you do have to have a Windows box on the other side to be able to do it. So if you have a Mac and the other person has a, has Windows, you can't use Quick Assist. So the 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 app that I tend to use for this type of uh, cross systems connectivity is TeamViewer, um, and right. I like TeamViewer because um, one, it's free for uh, non commercial use, right? So if it's just user to user and you're not working doing this for for business purposes for business IT support purposes, it's completely free. You don't have to register or buy it or anything like that. Um, it has file transfer built into it. So if you need to pass data between the two machines in addition to screen share, that's also built in. It also has built in um, voice over IP. Um, and, um, you know, so you can talk while you're doing it. You don't have to have a separate yeah, app to do, um, to, void, to do, you don't have to call on your phone or anything like that while you're doing it. So that's, that's really cool. Um, there's also Chrome Remote Desktop. Right. For those of us who are yeah. using the Chrome browser um, and I haven't tried it cross platform, but I have to assume that it works. 
right? So yeah, it should. Cool there shouldn't be any issues. There. Um, the other one I think is is VNC. A lot of people use for for remote uh, remoting into various servers and stuff. And I, I know it was a heavy duty. It's a it's an open source uh, yeah. remote control tool used in, in you know various data center type of of, of scenarios. Yeah, so I've heard of VNC only because I use that to remote into Raspberry Pis around my house. It's very easy to set up and use. Uh, I've also you heard of TeamViewer, but the only way, the, the only, my only interaction with TeamViewer is actually watching. I don't know if if you're familiar with Kit Boga. He is a uh, Twitch streamer. He has a YouTube channel. He actually calls scammers. These Microsoft. PayPal, IRS oh, yeah. scammers, and he wastes their time. He he, he allows them to, to set up TeamViewer on a virtual machine that he has running on his computer, and he will waste as much time as possible so they can't scam someone out of real money. And so that's their preferred app of choice, but they always use older versions that don't have built-in protections. Right. And it, it's hilarious. If, if you're not familiar with him, um, I, I recommend watching it. it. It's kind of addictive to listen to him. He has all these characters he plays, and uh, it, it's it's a good time but team viewer is it, it's not always bad it, it can be set up really easily it requires a verification code after they install the application it's if scammers can walk people through setting it up on their computer you could walk a loved one set it yeah it's, it it's actually it's actually very easy to use i mean yeah. it, it, it it creates a randomly generated uh password and id yeah. for each session so you have to ask the other person what their partner connection code is but it's usually it takes a, a you know a yeah. second just to do it yeah so it's there's a uh, also zoom zoom has built-in screen sharing so you can actually see what the other person's screen is you can even take over you can remotely control some devices i had i was troubleshooting an issue on a raspberry pi a few months ago and i just could not get it at the command line in terminal what what i was doing so and i was talking to a friend on slack and he's like actually just pull up zoom and let me take control of your iPad, which is what I was using to access uh, the terminal. And he was able to remotely control my iPad. So this this isn't just limited to computers as well. There are ways to take over phones and help walk people through it. Zoom's solution is limited to the iPad. It, it won't work on phones at all. But uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. I had no idea you could remotely control an iPad through Zoom, uh, which, you know, the only thing he couldn't do was type. All he had to do was tell me what to type. Uh, there's another third-party app called Screens. I've used this for years to remotely access my own Mac and in, even Windows PCs uh, when, from an iPad when I'm out working. And if there's something I just cannot get down on my iPad, I've been able to call back home and have you know different apps open and, and use them through that as well. And uh, it, it's been it's been really handy. It, there is I think it's around thirty bucks or something like that. I don't recall the exact price, but so it's not terribly expensive. But if you're going to be on call all the time helping your friends and family members. It's it's definitely money well invested uh, for that. One thing I haven't used though, Jason, that you brought up and I didn't even know existed was Microsoft's Quick Assist. And you said it's built into Windows 10? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. I'll have to check that out. I uh, would hope it would be pretty easy to set up. But going beyond, hey, I can't get this printer working or there's this really weird thing happening when I go into an app. What are some other common use cases or possible use cases for having remote access, even if it's always on, always available remote access to a friend or family member's computer? Well, you know, any, anything can kind of happen, you know, uh, depending on the, you know, how advanced a user we're talking about. Um, I mean, I, I haven't seen hardware issues pop up as much anymore, especially when people have laptops and these are much more solid state machines with less moving, almost no moving parts now. Right. Yeah. So I, unless you're talking about a, a more complex, you know, desktop PC, um, I really have not seen um, heavy hardware issues. Typically what I see is, um, you know, data corruption type things. Um, like I said, malware, malware sure. or, or, you know, just uh, people, you know, installing applications. And then you have this crapware where it, which installs extensions and browsers and things like that. Uh, my mother-in-law is, does this to herself all the time. She has a Chromebook, right? So you can't really pollute a Chromebook because it's it's just, it's an embedded operating system. It's Linux, it's running Chrome as a browser. That's the only thing it can do. But you still can install extensions in Chrome that will do very, very annoying things. So right. you may have to go into the extensions um, for your whatever browser, whether it's Edge or it's Chrome, because they're very similar browsers now, and remove extensions 
from from the system. Um, and it's and it'll it'll some of these things will drive you completely crazy. Some of these things uh, that are built, and they'll take over the entire bar. They'll switch your your search provider to do all sorts of screwy stuff that are that are super annoying. Yeah. So, do you have any other tips on helping a friend or family member? I know they're you know, in some instances, you're going to have to reinstall the operating system. Yep. You're going to have to do some more of that advanced work that maybe you're not able to remotely access a computer while it's being done. Yeah, so like you definitely, I mean, this is kind of like the the catch twenty two scenario, right? So a lot of us have done tech support during Thanksgiving or Christmas yeah. or Easter. You know, we, we we go over there with our bag of tricks, like Felix the cat. You know, I, I with fifteen USB drives and whatnot, and and we're ready to go with our boot disks and all those kinds of things. But we can't do that now because we we can't be physically present at the machine. So right. um, you definitely want to make sure that they have. Uh, one is sufficient cloud storage to do any kind of, of data backup if they need to be able to do that. Um, so like whether they got OneDrive or Google Drive or iCloud, make sure that they purchase whatever plans that they need to be able to do an in initial backups of, of their data. If God forbid you have to wipe the box. Right. Um, if you need to purchase USB flash drives and things like that, backup drives, make sure that they get them in advance of your support session, right? Because otherwise the, the a backup process could take up a while if you have to initiate something like that. Um, you're going to want to download any required updates that they might need in advance uh, because depending on the speed of the connection, it could take a very, very long time. So while the actual connect connection speed between you and them would is fast, right? Because it doesn't use a ton of bandwidth to do a screen share. They may only have like a 20 megabit connection to the internet. So if you have to download an entire OS reload, you know, it, yeah. that could take a lot of time, right? So yeah. um, what I suggest that you do is that is that you, you tell them how um, to do a, a how do you to do a, a, an, an OS, a USB um, uh, an installation disk, right? So there's a procedure to make a Windows 10 installation uh, USB. Um, you can go to the Microsoft site um, yeah. and basically you, 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 put, you put in a fresh USB drive. Um, you download the ISO file, and then there's a little utility that that, that generates um, what's needed on that USB drive to make it bootable. And you have one of those at, at them at all times. It's a fresh version of Windows, ready to go. And if if they have to, you can do an unattended um, install with it and and completely reset the OS. Now, um, not you don't necessarily need to do that all the time. Windows 10 has its own reset utility which will allow you to, to basically set the operating system back to a virgin install um, built into it. So um, generally speaking, that will work 90 odd percent of the time, sure. but it's good to have a fresh version of the installation of media uh, if you need to. Now on a Mac, it works a little bit different. A Mac, you can do uh, an internet-based install as uh, long as it has connectivity to the internet, but again, bandwidth is a concern. You yeah. might also want to have a copy of the install media uh, for a Macintosh as well. Yeah, and I would even go as far as suggesting if you know that having a family member walk or trying to walk a family member through creating the USB 10 USB boot drive for Windows 10 or whatever else for Mac, because you can create boot drives for Mac as well. They're just a little bit more complicated yeah. to do. Um, make them yourself and just ship them the USB drive. Ship them they one. Have them. Ship the, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just, and, send and just send do it, it on your yeah. own instead of having them walk through it. Um, <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> So I, I guess the biggest question I have for you, Perlo, is did you fix your mom's computer? Yeah, it got them fixed. And actually, Windows 10 has got a great undelete facility. I mean, if you go right into that garbage can, it has a, 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 a mass restore undelete function. And then that that fixed it like in minutes. So everything so, was just in the recycle was bin? Or was it had it already been emptied out of the recycle bin? Um, it was it was in the it was already it was in the recycle bin. It was okay, like, so. there was there was literally like like thirty gigs of stuff in the recycle bin. So and I think that's kind of like the prime example of what most family member tech support issues are like. The yeah. the icons disappeared, but yeah. they were just a couple clicks away. It's just getting over that hump of realizing that you can restore items and they don't actually disappear once they go to the recycle bin. And that's a pretty typical experience. The issues I know that I've personally helped family members fix, whether it's on a phone or on a computer, have been very basic, but yet confusing to someone who's not very tech savvy. 
Yeah. So while you're there and you're and you know you're looking at whatever problem needs to be fixed, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of other things you can do uh, to save further you know anguish. Uh, make sure their browsers are all up to date, you know, along with any add-ons you know that they're yeah. using. Um, you want to remove crapware. Um, the, I mean, on Windows, you want to go to the Add Remove Programs menu with the person and say that you're helping. Say and remove anything that they don't use regularly or don't recognize. Um, you know, and again, go through all those browser extensions on Chrome and Edge and see if there's anything there that doesn't look like it should be there. Um, you want to make sure that they're, they're using a virus scanner. Um, if their preloaded third-party virus scanner that came with the machine has expired, you know, whether it's an old version of McAfee and they decide they didn't want to spend the 60 bucks or something to, to update it, and yeah. now that it, now it's no longer scanning, change it back to the, the, the default Windows Defender, you know, and because that still works pretty darn well. Yeah, um, I, I use and, that, and I don't have know, any issues. Those are these are just simple things that you can do to avoid you know further problems. Yeah, those are all hand, handy tips. I use an app called App Zapper on Mac, and what that yep. does is because you can you can drag applications to the the trash can on a Mac, but it only deletes the app. It doesn't bring all the extra files that it's created and databases it has stored on your Mac's uh, hard drive. So I use an app called App Zapper. And what that does is when you drag an application to the trash can, it looks for all the associated files and asks you, hey, do you want to include these files as well? They're linked to this application. So in a lot of times, the storage space that an application takes is hidden in all of those files. So it, you know, I think it's like five dollars, something like that. I paid for it yeah. years ago, and it's paid off tremendously because I, I use it constantly. Every time I delete an application, it takes a, you know a few extra files with it, which is great to have. But yeah, while you're in a computer fixing a printer issue or some other random bug or or whatever, uh, take a few minutes to tune up their machine. So you know, hopefully, it's some preventative maintenance. I think that's some pretty sage advice, Perlo. Uh, yeah. Any closing thoughts? Yeah. Um... In addition to you know getting that operating system working in good order, um, you want to make sure you have the installation media or the equivalent registration codes for all the major software and apps that yeah. are installed on the system. Um, older versions of Office, and you see people like with Office 2007 and 2012 or whatever it is, 2016, they all use CD keys, right? Um, yeah. But the newest version of uh, Microsoft Office is Microsoft 365. Um, and that uses a cloud-based install and entitlements that get purchased and activated um, from Microsoft directly on office.com. And it's linked to the user's Microsoft ID, right? So um, personal licenses of, of Microsoft 365 are not expensive, uh, but they have to be renewed on a yearly basis. Now, the best right. value for that is Microsoft 365 Family Edition. That's $99 a year and it's good for six people and provides a terabyte of cloud storage per person, right? So every single one of those users for that $99 a year that covers six people, they get Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Out, OneNote, Outlook, Access and Publisher, okay? Now the, the personal license uh, is $69.99 a year. Uh, and that just gives you, you know, that one single user entitlement. So it's, it's really worth the, the extra 30 bucks, you know, to, to have every member of that family get their own in, uh, office entitlement for a year. Now, there's also an office home and student, which doesn't have a yearly renewable cost, but it's $149 up front. But you don't get continual feature updates, just just just, you know, bug patches uh, and you get. Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, but but no additional cloud storage. So I still think the Office 365 uh, Family Edition is probably the best bet. Um, and again, make sure you have all the other keys and entitlements to the other things that they use. You know, um, Adobe Cloud, other stuff that they may be using um, to run that machine. So you want to get like a full software inventory and make sure that you can reinstall all those things. Uh, right. You know, with the codes that, that you know, make sure they're not using you know pirated software. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> right. really important. I don't know about your family members, but mine have a notebook of all of their passwords, unfortunately, yeah. as well yeah. as application keys and everything else. So maybe getting them to send you a picture of that notebook so that you have those codes on hand and putting it in your own password manager is probably the way to go. And as far as Microsoft 365, that's that's good advice as well. I think the biggest benefit there is the one terabyte of storage that they can then use to back up their necessary files and folders should something happen. You can even back up your photos automatically from your phone to OneDrive, which is a huge benefit for anyone who takes a lot of photos and videos on their phone. 
Yes. Now, like I said, remember, you have to pull all this stuff off remotely. You know, this isn't yeah. Thanksgiving. Right. It's not Christmas, right? It's COVID-19, right? If, this, <laughs> if, this, if, if, it, if there is a hardware issue or it's something that does require human intervention, you probably can't fix whatever it needs to be fixed unless that person's relatively close to you and they can drop the box off at your front door. Right. So if they're far away, be prepared to find someone who can repair that thing locally and work through the vendor tech support with that person um, on the phone or whatever if you're to help determine um, the actual resolution uh, to, to get them through it. Yeah, that's, so. that's good advice as well. I think that's probably a good place to stop, Jason. I wish everyone good luck on being a remote tech support agent. It's, it's a lot to learn and a lot to handle at times, but uh, you can do it. Just a little bit of effort. I it's, a thanks, it's a thankless job, Jason, <laughs> but someone's got to do it. It sure is. I'm right. Jason Cipriani. And I'm Jason Perlow. And this is Jason Squared. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And make sure to check out more of our work at ZDNet.com.